are listening to Omnitalk Retail Fast Five, brought to you in partnership with the A&M Consumer and Retail Group, Firework, SPS Commerce, and Sezzle. Ranked in the top 10% of all podcasts globally, the Retail Fast Five is the podcast that we hope makes you feel a little smarter, but more importantly, a little happier each week too. Today is August 10th, 2023. I'm your host, Ann Mazenga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we are here once again to discuss the most important headlines from the past week that highlight how the physical, digital, and human elements of retail are coming together to shape the future. Chris. Yes, Anne. Are I'm, you ready? Are you ready to just knock this out? We're, we're This is like our last episode before vacation week. It's August. Yes, we, it's time for vacation. Yes, we take, for those listening, we take two weeks off. We try to take two weeks off every summer. And uh, this year, we've already taken one week off. And we're going to take another week off next week. And uh, yeah, we clear out the office. We vacate because vacations are meant to be vacated. And that's what my high school English teacher used to say. The, I, the, Jesu- the Jesuit priest at Brophy College Preparatory oh, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, which I went to for a year. And then I got so the hell out fancy. of there. So fancy. So fancy. public school and couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't take the Catholic parochial education or whatever the hell it's called. Um, oh my gosh. But, that uh, reminds me, I just saw the movie Lady Bird. Have you seen that? Oh movie? yeah, Lady Bird. Great flick. Great oh flick. my gosh. Yeah. Well, I don't know about great flick. We'll have to dive deeper into this oh, on, well the, done, on one of our well plane done, plane trips. But yeah, uh, but it did like harken back to my days at parochial school. And it was I got quite a few laughs out of that whole that whole scene, yeah. those scenes in the movie. I can't I can't remember. Is, is parochial for Catholic or is Catholic for Catholic and parochial for the other stuff? I can't remember I don't the know. answer to that. I'm, I'm just I should, confused myself. I should know this. I should Royal know this. listeners, set us straight, please. Set us straight because I don't know the answer. But, but yeah, we've got an awesome show today. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited for these topics. We were looking at the week and initially we were like, eh, but actually as I came to think about it and Met. thought about it overnight, like I'm kind of like, this is going to be fun. There's All some right. good meat on All these right. bones All right. this week. Yeah, I, let's do and it. I, and for those that like disagreements, I have a feeling this could be high on the disagreement scale. And what do you yes. think about that one? Do you think my prediction? I think there's going to be a lot of. I think there's going to be a lot of of deep discussion, Chris. Well, I don't know about disagreements. I think deep discussion, a lot of question asking. There's going to be a lot, a lot to follow along with. So listeners, while we're on vacation next week, you should definitely send us some messages and, uh, and let us know what you think about the, the discussion the the deep discussion in today's podcast. Yeah. You know why I like deep discussion, Ann? Why? Because of the alliteration. Deep oh, God. discussion. All okay. right. Okay. All right, but before we get to the headlines today, we've got another exciting grocery shop update. And for those watching, I even have my grocery shop mug. Those watching are newly styled Fast Five, which is the best way to get your weekly dose of all the news happening in retail. Do it on YouTube. Today, we're taking you on a little trip around the globe this time, not in a literal sense, But to emphasize that grocery shops reach extends far beyond the borders of the U.S. It's a global phenomenon, Anne. Oh, yes, of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, geez, yeah, it really is. Let's talk about what they mean, though, when they say everyone, Anne, everyone with quotes is headed to grocery shops. It's like that song. Everybody, 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 everybody. You know that one? Good needle drop, Anne. Anne dropping the needles. Maybe I'll just keep doing Maybe I'll just keep doing this in the background as you're talking about grocery shops. Dude, Great dude, needle dude. drop. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yep. So, Anne, picture this. Yes. A gathering of 5,000 executives with a staggering 70% holding director titles or higher, all in one place, and hailing from over 40 countries, and that number is steadily climbing. Leading retailers and brands from the global stage, including Tesco, Boots, Walmart Canada, Metro, and Sainsbury's, are joining hundreds of U.S. businesses like Kroger, 7-Eleven, Sam's Club, and Whole Foods, which makes Grocery Shop the world's biggest gathering of global grocery ecosystem execs. Also some great alliteration there. Oh, yes. They've got big names from the UK, from France, the US, of course, Latin America with Mercado Libre, and even some of our Aussie pals are flying all the way to Vegas. This is your single best chance to interact in person with companies that might not typically be within your networking scope. Here, here to that. That is for sure. And guess what? Right now is a perfect time to grab your ticket since prices increase tomorrow night at midnight. So go visit grocershop.com slash Omnitalk. That's grocershop.com slash Omnitalk to join your global peers. 
All right, and let's do this show. In today's Fast Five, AM's Chad Lusk is going to stop by to give us five insightful minutes on in store grocery tech. And as well, we've got news on Wawa's new shelfless convenience store, JD Sports and its new virtual try on mirror, Amazon Hub, a new local delivery network from Amazon. Amazon also bringing its just walk out tech to apparel merchandising. Can't wait to talk about that. But we begin today with news out of Nike and that's right, Chris. Headline number one, Nike is planning a network of fitness boutique studios. According to Retail Dive, Nike is opening a boutique fitness concept in partnership with FitLab. The studio concept will offer live classes, and the first location is in LA later this year. It's opening. The studios will be open to everyone 18 and older and will include Nike training studios, which will focus on functional strength training and Nike running studios, which also focus on endurance workouts. Retail Dive went on to add that currently the retailer is offering an unlimited workout membership at the studios for $99 per month for founding members. But those founding members must also pay $49 to, quote, reserve a spot, end quote, as a founding member. Finally, Chris, once the studios open, Nike also plans to offer drop-in rates and unlimited monthly workouts with prices varying by location. Chris, I cannot wait to hear what you think about this. This came out on Friday and I was like, oh my God, this is yeah, massive Yeah, you were news. all over social media on this. I, yeah. my, hunch, my hunch is you love this, but uh, okay, I, that's my guess. Okay, but okay. I don't know. For me, and I don't, I don't know where I stand on this. Like I'm kind of split and- okay. I'm kind of hedging. I'm kind of hedging more towards the side of I don't like it, as you can really? probably tell from the way I'm talking about it. Yeah, I can tell you seem a little like, mm, like, like constipated in thought. Constipated in thought. That that's a good way to describe me generally <laughs> in life. And constipated <laughs> in thought. But yeah, I mean, I, the reason I don't like it is because essentially when I pull back the covers on this, it's like Nike's getting into the gym business, which yeah. is one of the worst, most competitive spaces around. Like it's yeah. Just, really hard to do it. It's hard to keep up with the trends and honest, I'm, honestly, the fads that come along with the gym business. And so like, you know, I asked that, I have to ask the question strategically, like why is Nike better than all the thousands of other options of gyms that are going to be around? Is it because it's branded Nike? I mean, yeah, that, that's a bridge that's a little too far for me. So then it, okay. So then I look at the announcement. I'm like, okay. It sounds like they're doing this with a partner. So it gets into a little bit of the like, Four seasons running a property under that brand name as a ho- in the hotel industry. It's kind of akin to that, right? Okay. Which which makes it a little better, but my gut tells me that we're gonna see a few of these. They're not gonna take off like gangbusters. They're gonna be hard to run. There's the industry so fatty, like I said before. It's not gonna go anywhere, is what my gut tells me. But I don't know. Prove me wrong. And so like That's- I said, my hunch is you love this. My my gut tells me you love this, but I'm I think I'm I'm negative on this one. Are you? And then that's fatty with a, with a DDY, not fatty with a TTY. Yeah, that would be fat, P-H-A-T-A-N, you know? Oh <laughs> yes, okay. it's fatty, F-A-D. I, yes, I can understand all of your points. I think it makes sense. Um, you know, it's hard to find economies of scale when you start getting into physical property. I think that's a big issue, like you're talking about, with the, you know, the actual build it, build outs of the gyms. Um, but I think that there's a lot of there there's a lot of coulds, I will say, in the statement I'm about to make. There's a lot of opportunity, especially when you start to think about, you know, what what Nike is bringing to the table here. And I think that uh, the closest comparison that that I can figure out, and if I was Peloton in this case, I would be very yeah, concerned. You Peloton really hasn't had a, a worthwhile competitor so far. And I think that with Nike getting into this, again, this is not something that all brands can do. This is something that Nike specifically is trying to do. And I think it what Nike's doing with this is taking all the best best parts of Peloton, which they already have the workout anywhere, when you want it, how you want it. They already have that with a Nike training club that has a comparable number of subscribers already um, to what Peloton has, surprisingly. Um, and so I think if you take that and you start to explore what you can do inside of a Nike store or adjacent to a Nike store with some of these these workout programs, I think is worth the experiment for Nike. I'm a little mm-hmm. surprised it took them this long to do it. But I think the, the other part of this is that 
You also have Nike's flywheel that's funding this that Peloton does not have. You have all of the operations Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from, you know, the apparel, from all of the other community organized events that they already have going that can help fund this or maybe sustain these tests a little bit longer than than any other competitor could do. Certainly like Lululemon or somebody who's also tried to get into this similar space. But the last the last point I'd, I'd make, and I think that what is is interesting is you know, part of the value of what Nike can do here, again, with that flywheel is take some of these instructors that people follow. Like that's why people go to Peloton. It's the instructors, it's the community, it's the convenience. Mm -hmm. And I think Nike has more power if they wanted to, to turn those trainers, those trainer influencers into more of like a Nike athlete sort of Mm -hmm. level. And Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody else Mm -hmm. can do that. So I think that there's, there's a lot of potential here that if Nike executes this in the right way, they could have a lot of success here. They could present a a challenger to Peloton. It's just going to depend on how they can get these operations running as a efficiently as possible and how they can scale them as quickly. Because the last thing I'll add is if you, if you don't have convenience, (laughs) if you can't pay off, like I have a club that's around the corner for me or, you know, as close as the nearest shopping mall or wherever the Nike store is like, Mm -hmm. if that's not open for me, you lose people. And that's the missing component here that Nike, I think is able to offer. Yeah. I mean, I think honestly, I, I don't, none of those points convince me actually All the right. other point too, like the membership's pretty cheap, right? 99 bucks. Like yeah. that's pretty cheap, right? For a gym membership. So it makes me wonder why they're not going more up market with this, but that's another point. No, I mean, the, the reason, it, the reason it's not convincing to me, Anne, is you look at what else has been going on in the industry with the people you mentioned. So Peloton, yeah. why hasn't, Pe- if this is such a great idea, why hasn't Peloton been able to get their in-person studios to work in any other city outside of New York? Like that seems like the easiest goddamn thing to make happen yes. out there and they can't do it. Lululemon. But Nike's they, doing it. Yeah, that's what I well, mean. Nike's like, trying, trying to do to it. Do it. That, trying to trying do it. Trying to do it. So, and but, has I'm, the funding I'm, to back it up. But, that's well, what yeah, but I know, but yeah, but, and then also Lululemon, like that, you use them too. Like they've been building their stores out, you know, with some of these, you know, studios inside them. Seems like they've pulled back on that as a strategy too. Or we're just not hearing as much about it. Like when we went to check out that store in Chicago where that was full on experience. We took a class there um, with Gideon. Remember that Gideon? But get like, fit with Gideon. Yeah, I yeah get, we got fit with Gideon. But like, it doesn't, it seems like they're pulling back on that too. So I think this is much harder to do well than people are probably realizing getting For excited sure. in this announcement. For sure. All right. So we let's should we keep rolling then? Yes. You're good? All yes. right. All right. Well, headline number two is really interesting. Wawa is testing a fully shelveless store in Philadelphia. And every time I write shelveless in my notes, Ann, it goddamn autocorrects to sleeveless. It's really frustrating. I like sleeveless digital stores too. I mean, <laughs> kind it's of the same time. thing. It's yeah, right? Take those sleeves hey. off. Hey, it is Philly. <laughs> Shout out to Evan. <laughs> Shout out to Evan, loyal listener. Uh And this news today comes to us from Fox 29 in Philadelphia. Very, very interesting news here. So here's what it means. Here's what a shelfless store means. It means that the new shopping experience requires all items to be purchased on the Wawa mobile app or also via touchscreen kiosk in the store. And you know how much I love kiosks. I know. And And then all the orders are fulfilled by Wawa staff behind the counters. There are no products. Emphasis on no products visible on shelves in this store. And I know you got a ton of thoughts on this question. We actually have a ton of experience on this topic. I can't wait to share with the audience. But this is also our A&M put you on the spot question this week. Are you ready for it? Starting off with a bang. All right. Typically, and this is true, everything Wawa does turns to gold. In this case, do you read this announcement and think, convenience store of the future and fulfilling a key customer need? Or do you think Piggly Wiggly over a hundred years ago when shoppers would present their grocery orders to clerks who grab goods off inventory shelves for them? Okay. First, I want to thank listener Jenny Lewis, who sent me this story. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I think it's a great awesome one to talk find. about. Yes. Yeah. Um, second, look, I, th- I think that you have to look at this store differently. Um, One, it's a one-store test. They're going to learn a lot from this experiment. I think this is different because 
back in the day, like I had to go back in the day to curbside pickup. There are still people today actually who tell me like, I don't get curbside pickup. Why would you want curbside pickup? Like, I don't think this is the end all be all for the future of convenience stores. No, I don't think so to answer Anam's question. But I do think that there's a need state for this. It's taking the the GoPuff, the DoorDash, the 7-Eleven, the Instacart models in convenience. And it's giving you another option to pick up curbside when you want it. And that is more convenient for people. So I think it's just expanding this definition of convenience. I hate the idea. Interesting. Of- I hate the idea of going in and having to order from a kiosk. That is a terrible thing. Like, Wawa, I don't even know why this is an option. Like, let's just go with mobile order first and then ha- give people the convenience of like, there's right. not a giant parking lot like a Walmart to drive through to go pick up your order. There's no, like, it's easy to expand this into locations to test this. And you have a lot of locations to do curbside pickup that are convenient for me on my way home from work or school or whatever. But, and and I think finally, it's probably safer for the workers and doesn't require as many workers inside of a convenience store, potentially. But I'll, I think I hate the kiosk idea. I think that's terrible. I, I But I do like this as a test for, is there a need state for consumers to be able to order convenience items ahead of time, pull up and pick them up and go? Right. They get some, dis- you're right. I mean, there's some dispensation for it being a test and it's yes. one hell of an audacious test, right? For sure. For sure. But- yes. I think the other point is you're bringing up good points. On you have to look at the context of what are they experimenting with or why, and ask ask yourself that question. Is it meant yeah. to be a new way of running a convenience store in the age of like rampant supposed theft? Although there's a lot of questions about how rampant theft is. Is it is it that or is yeah. it like designed more cerebrally where it's actually meant to be a fulfillment center that if they can get any in store traffic, it's just a bonus. Right. If it's the latter, then. I can get on board with it. But if it's the convenience store option, I freaking hate it. Like I sure. hate I hate this because if you're going to force even if you just force people to use an app, forget the kiosk which is dumb. Yeah. Why not just go to a gated entry system then, you know, to to help ameliorate all the issues that you're trying to ameliorate with that setup because removing products from the floor undoubtedly is going to hurt sales and and impact your basket sizes too. And therefore, the overall viability of this as a standalone convenience store concept with the economics of a traditional convenience store is just not there. Because still overwhelmingly, the majority of sales volume happens in the physical store. So you're not going to get that added benefit that you have from all the activity that you're talking about of the people that still want to interact with this via curbside pickup. The best analogy that I can think of for this store is Argos in the UK. Okay. It's basically the same model where, yeah. but they but they do that specifically for curbside, like basically like a pickup location in a busy urban setting. And they're doing it mainly in electronics and small appliances and categories like that. Convenience store is different. You want those items yeah. conveniently. And so if you think about removing them from shelves, for those people that are just walking by, this makes that experience so much more inconvenient at the end of the day, because it's not going to be as quick and it's not going to be as fast. It's basically, it's basically like, it's also like service merchandise was in the day, but with no displays. I like the concept when there's display merchandise, like I like the Best Buy test Mm -hmm. that they're running in North Carolina. That makes sense because the price on display in those, you know, you can interact. Yeah. Yeah. In those categories you can, and it's a different category again. Yeah. It's not, it's not Doritos. Right. Like, I just want to grab Doritos. I don't want to wait for somebody to bring those out to me from the back. That's just, yeah. that's, that's asinine. I, I think if I I'm, think- if I'm, if I'm walking by or wanting to, you know, in that convenient mood, which in, in an urban setting, you oftentimes are, but go yeah. ahead. Last one. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that's important to focus on here is I think there's too much attention being, being turned in the story to people going in the store, eliminate going in the store. Like it's taking. So you think the- they're that smart in this test that that's why they're doing this. It's I do. More- I, I think. Okay. I think right. they are taking, they they also did a drive-through concept, so. you'll remember. So I think yeah. it's like, what are they learning in the drive-through version of this? And what are they learning in the curbside pickup of this? I think I think it's not going to be about people going in the shore and the shelveless store. I think that's a stupid way to look at this. I think it's how are we doing what you were talking about earlier about using this maybe as a micro fulfillment center to do fulfill deliveries and then do curbside pickup only. So I think yeah. there's more to learn from this than just what what meets the eye in the headline. And from the photos in the article too, it seems like the hot food is still available like you'd expect the hot food to be available, which gets people in the store. And that's probably a significant portion of the business too, which so it's smart. So yeah, I mean, this is why you test, right? This is why we say like, and uh, the more audacious the test, the better, because the more you're going to learn. Yes. However, this next example, I think, Ed, 
I don't know that I agree that every test not, is a good Not test. worth the test here. So headline <laughs> number three, JD Sports is trying its hand at virtual try-on. According to Chain Storage, the global British athletic retailer is utilizing proprietary AR-based virtual try-on mirror from 010 at its New York and Chicago flagship stores as part of its, quote, need it now, end quote, apparel campaign. The irony in need it now and AR should not be lost on anyone. I might add when no, customers <laughs> when customers in these New York and Chicago stores interact with the AR mirrors, zero ten computer vision algorithms estimate the user's body shape and position in space, producing an accurate three D model of the user in three dimensional space. AR based cloth simulation then helps to replicate the behavior of the virtual clothing uh. and render it onto the screen. Customers can pick up an item f- available for try on. Uh, on the AR mirror, select, I want to buy this item, scan the QR code on an in-store iPad and be directed <laughs> oh to the JD Sports website to complete the purchase of the original physical piece. Chris, I can't even speak <laughs> to all of the detail involved I, I know, in right? AR try-on. So I would like you to give your insight on what you think of this test from JD. Oh, and you had me at AR-based cloth simulation. <laughs> you totally did. <laughs> not like oh my god, oh my god. What this is a cloth simulation this is getting out of hand it really is i mean this this concept as an idea honest i, I i'm just gonna be really blunt here and like really frank this idea has got to effing stop yeah like i see this idea at every trade show we go to usually multiple times there's some company that's paid for some big real estate at the trade show to put their ar mirror up so everyone can see it But like, I just don't get it. Like I'm in a store with physical garments. Why do I need to see them in an an augmented reality state in the store? Like that makes no goddamn sense to me. You know, and I don't even think it's that like, Chris, I was trying to understand. I think you pick the garment in the mirror. I don't it's a virtual (laughs) garment. It's not even the physical. So you virtually pick a garment from the mirror one person at a time. I might add, right. Use this mirror. And then you have to take a scan, a QR code and scan it into another kiosk. Like this is fraught with friction. Well, it sounded like too, that you could get the, like the, the online catalog could be available through this too. You can see how you want it to be on you. but like. And like, and 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 I, I'm also tired of the hot model standing in front of the mirror. Like, let's call it what it is. Like, that's just so so silly. But like, if I'm in the store, I'm gonna one put it on myself on the showroom, which most guys do, and then you know, or mo- a lot of people do. I don't even have to be gender specific on there, and I apologize for that. But like, or are you just gonna go in the goddamn fitting room, right? I mean, yeah. like, why are you gonna use this? It's this is again an example. It's 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 the modern it's the modern day modern I say modern day like this this was that long ago but like it's the new equivalent of the extend the aisle kiosk you know to show the other assortment that you could also by the way look up on your phone at any time because okay. your goddamn phone is the better way to do this um, and so like that to me any retail I mean the last point I'm making any retailer that greenlights this idea going forward I'm going to mock mercilessly. <laughs> In any way possible, because I I can't stand this. And you know, if if the company, what is it, zero zero dark thirty or zero, <laughs> zero 10, ten wants zero ten wants to come at me and talk to us more about it, like let's do it. But I, I it's just so silly to me. I just don't understand it. Do you agree? I, I don't, or yes, I, I totally agree. I don't have much more to add outside of. The thing that I do think is cool about this is they are creating a 3D avatar of your body, which can be very valuable for understanding fit. But there's no mention in here of like, we're going to send you the 3D avatar of your body so that if you decide to order online for any from JD in the future, like that's where this is valuable on my own mobile device, as you as you outlined. But there's no mention of like the connection point with the consumer and actually yeah. being able to take that avatar for something that's more useful down the line. Not when I'm sitting in your store. I think it's just absolutely but, ridiculous. And do that in the fitting room, right? Yeah. Do that like FitMatch is doing. Like do that yes. in the fitting room where it's a sure. natural part of the experience. Like or on your own then, phone. Or on your own phone. Understand if that works. Or on your own phone, right? Don't yeah. do it as a standalone mirror in the store. Yes, hundred percent. All right. Well, and we've been talking about it a lot. We've got, we've been talking about a lot on the show, lots of topics that come up a lot, retail media networks, a lot of tech related to grocery 
and how that's going to play out in the future. And so we are excited today to debut a new segment that we are calling Five Insightful Minutes. For Five Insightful Minutes is Talk friend, Chad Lust, the partner and managing director at the AM Consumer and Retail Group. Chad will be discussing with us his company's latest report on the most impactful in store digital technology investments within the grocery industry. Chad, first of all, tell us about this new report series and why you felt it was so important to come on our show and discuss it with us today. Pilots and rollouts of in store technology have been coming out at a blistering pace, and our clients have been asking us all kinds of questions in terms of where to invest and what has the staying power and, and what they need to do going forward. So we we launched this retail report series on consumer facing in-store technology, which we'll do semi-annually across retail sectors, starting with grocery here. And, and we think we've captured the timing well because when COVID took consumer traffic online, most retail investments followed suit, for instance, in fulfillment, retail media networks outside the store. But lo and behold, once the U.S. consumer started to shop in store again, retail investments have, have re-entered with them. So after a relative pause, things have really picked up in in-store investments. And we've seen some pretty big announcements in the past couple months. With that said, Chad, it's the first grocery edition. What technologies did you decide to cover and why? So we started by following the news. Uh, in May, Walmart announced the rollout of 60 million digital shelf labels. A few weeks later, Kroger said it was expanding digital smart um, cooler screens to 500 stores. Innovative Schnucks is going big with smart uh, shopping carts. So we started with those three. Okay. Uh, but beyond just covering headlines, you know, all three of these hit really clear value propositions, albeit differently. Um, so it's important to recognize why retailers make tech investments to uh, create an operational efficiency and enhance margin to improve a customer experience and, of course, to sell more goods. Uh, but when tons of different benefits and use cases, but but pick, pick a primary source for your ROI. Right with electronic shelf labels, it's about the ROI and labor savings uh, in replacing all of those hours of manual label changes. Uh, with cooler screens, you're trying to drive top line sales growth through additional unplanned or impulse purchases. Smart carts are interesting. Uh, I think the jury's still out. On the surface, it appears the primary benefit is an alternative to a, a just walk out cashierless experience. But but I believe the ROI really needs to come through opportunities and serving personalized content to shoppers. Uh, of course, all these are still being tested, but but Walmart and Kroger's rollouts demonstrate some realized ROI. There. Yeah, this has also been the year of the retail media network, almost potentially too much so. So how do you realistically see retail media networks showing up in store? I'd say today, not very well. You know, any of these places where you see these digital ads showing mm. up, whether it's cooler screens, smart carts, free asks, TVs, they're trying to generate an impulse buy, but but what they're actually providing are, are broadcast TV commercials for the general population. It's like bringing the living room into the store. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't bring the e-com experience to the store. The, today, in-store doesn't match the power of retail media networks online because it's missing a critical component. You have the you know background analytics to drive consumer preferences. You now have uh, mechanisms to show the advertising in store, but what's been missing is the customer identification. So knowing who you are, you know, you have that sign in online, but in a store, the retailer historically has only ever been able to know who I am at exit when I'm paying and I put in my loyalty number when it's too late to do anything about it. You can't personalize when you don't know who the person is. And that's what right. makes retail media networks online so powerful, that personalization. So once a retailer can know who you are, you know, walking the store at entry, uh, you complete that trifecta and can bring the full power retail media networks into the store. So it combines the shiny toys we're talking about with the know-how. So Chad, what are you advising that grocery retailers do when contemplating these and other technology investments to make? In a world of limited capital, you have to pick the technology that hits on the most critical and appropriate use case based on your unique value prop. So choose among the three-point framework that makes sense for your brand, your customers, and your roadmap, whether you're driving operational excellence, customer experience, or, or top-line growth. Second, 
pilot, test, learn, don't be overly wedded to anything, knowing when to walk away. These ROIs are still being developed and they're unique to individual customer segments. You know, just because Kroger is rolling out cooler screens doesn't mean it works right. for X regional discount groceries. Right. Uh, and point. finally, as perhaps the most important, future-proof your investments, right? Think about what technologies allow future flexibility so you don't lock yourself in, but allow for additional benefits that just compound over time as other tech around the store improves. In your personal opinion, which of the technologies that you've discussed today, if you were a grocer, would be at the top of your investment list? I don't want to talk out both sides of my mouth. So I, I, would, I would start by saying it depends, right? Not right for everyone. Again, it's assuming that it uh, uh, fits with my unique value prop based on what I just said. Um, I, I think electronic shelf labels excite me the most here because there's of the three, there's the most clear, compelling ROI case in terms of the labor efficiency and, and savings. And whether that is distorting labor to other elements in the store uh, or, or having the opportunity for reduction but but what really gets me excited is around where this can go in the future, combining it with uh, other elements of you know a baseline infrastructure that creates a smart store of the future, cameras, monitoring, dwell time, dynamic pricing. Uh, this opens up so much of an infrastructure within the store that that uh, that's my number one right now. Okay, let's get back to show headline number four, and this headline is a little bit of a catch up from us being on vacation for part of. Uh, late July, so bear with us on this, but Amazon has launched a new local delivery network. According to Axios, Amazon plans to tap thousands of U.S. small businesses from bodegas to florists to deliver its packages by the end of the year. Dubbed Amazon Hub Delivery, this is Amazon's latest attempt to expand its last mile network, and here is how it works. Drivers from Amazon's delivery service partner network drop off the packages to participating local businesses which are required to have a secure area for storage. And then the same florist, bodegas, whatever, are expected to deliver an average of 30 packages a day for seven days a week. Not counting, of course, major holidays. According to Axios as well, Amazon wouldn't state exactly how much it pays per package, but based on a reported extra earnings of $27,000 a year, the rate would be about $2.50 per package. And you fought hard for this story to include it because, uh, you know, we might have missed it while we were out on vacation. We brought it back in. What? Why did you want to talk about this so much? I just don't understand. I don't understand this. Like, I'm all for the tests, like especially Amazon. Go ahead. Test your faces off. But I just don't understand as a former small business owner. And still, but as a as a small business owner with a, a physical store, I cannot understand the financial benefit of taking part in this program. I think you look at number one, like secure storage for 30 Amazon packages per day. Like who has room for that? Also, right. like so the security of it. Now I have to figure out logistics for my drivers to like incorporate my deliveries plus the Amazon deliveries. What happens if there there's always some sort of like change to what the Amazon requirements are for drop off versus my you know drop off as a florist? Like whose packages take priority? My own as my florist. Obviously, I'm going to make sure that my flowers are going out first. That are you know time and temperature controlled and need to get to places in specific amounts of time. Like. I just do not understand the logic behind this. And especially when you're only estimating $27,000 a year, like that's not even enough to pay your delivery driver's salary for a year. Like it just does not make sense to me. Um, and I think that I have to compare it to like what Walmart Go Local is doing and like kind of doing the reverse of this, like Go Local just saying like, we will take your deliveries off your plate. To me, that seems like a much more worthwhile investment and opportunity for these small businesses to like carve out ways to stick to what they're good at and be a better florist or be a better bodega operator and not try to get into the delivery business. But I, I'm ah. curious, Chris, what are you, what are ah. you thinking here? Are you like pro Amazon package delivery slash florist yeah, slash I deliver your toilet paper from the bodega? Interesting. So you're kind of you're kind of of the opinion like Amazon's kind of trying to dupe the bodegas and the florists. Like that's kind of what your take is here. Like I just hey, don't. We like got it. this opportunity for you. Do you want to take it? You can earn some extra money. That's that's kind of what, yeah. Yeah, I like mean, get rich quick. 
Like yeah, this I, feels like a get rich quick, like sign that you see on the post outside in your neighborhood. Yeah, like, that's interesting. Yeah. I never, I didn't think about it that way when I was thinking about it last night, but I mean, I'm, I don't hate it as much as you do. I mean, I think for Amazon, it kind of, it's just kind of an extension of like, how do we get more people to deliver packages for us at scale in a way yeah. that, you know, this tends to be pretty difficult and try to figure out a way to save money. It's probably a tech platform that basically makes all this happen, which Amazon's really good at doing. They put it out there. They see who wants to do it. And, you know, basically no, no skin off their back if it doesn't work, but if they get a few people to sign up for it and they like doing it, you know, fine. You know, is it worth the extra $27,000 if I was running a bodega or a, a, a floral shop? I I'm with you. I wouldn't do it because it's not my business. We talk about that a lot. What business are you in? Are you in the floral business? Or are you in the Amazon delivery business? Those are two really different things and hard to do both of them well. So you know, careful. I would be careful, or I agree with you. Be leery of you know trying to do this thinking it's a quick way to earn some extra money. Um, but you know, from an Amazon standpoint, I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? Go for it. Only because Go it's Amazon it. and they can afford to compensate if they can't. You know, <laughs> they don't know. Like if, if like anybody else, Target, Walmart, you know, Home Depot. I mean, name your retail. If they're like, hey, you want to deliver some packages for us, local, local, Vinny the florist. You know, go for it. You know. Fergal the florist from the town. Shout out to the town. Fergal. Fergal. Oh That's such god. a great movie. Oh my god. All right. We're moving on, Chris. Uh, let's talk about something better that Amazon is doing. Uh, headline number five. Yeah, this Seattle- is super cool. Yes. The Seattle Seahawks and Lumen Field are planning to implement Amazon's Just Walk Out technology for Yes fan merchandise. According to Lumen Field blog post, Amazon's Just Walk Out tech will be deployed within its new Seahawks Pro Shop outlet. Their fans will find a variety of team gear, including hats, shirts, jerseys, and souvenirs. Customers can go in, grab a hat, t-shirt, jersey, foam finger, whatever they might need and want, and simply leave through an exit gate, even while wearing their purchases. Once a customer picks the items they want, they simply use their credit card to hover or sorry, use their credit card or hover their palm over an mm-hmm. Amazon One device to exit. Mm-hmm. When they love pass- hovering my palm, Anne. I know, I know. <laughs> I just, I just hovered my palm last night. Um, when they pass through the exit gate, the credit card they use or link or that is linked to their Amazon One ID will be charged for the items that they picked. Chris, this is huge, huge, and like. Mm-hmm. Not a, not covered again as much as I think it should be. But yeah, what you're are your right. thoughts? Actually, yeah, yeah. And actually, the headline doesn't do the full story justice either. Um, yeah, I mean, we saved the best for last. No offense to our buddy Chad, but like this story is potentially massive. Yeah. Um, first, a couple of points like I'd make. First, the key thing, one one of the key things before we get into the apparel side of this is they're going to exit authorization again, not pre-entry mm-hmm. authorization again too, which I think makes the concept more accessible to the average user, right? Um, mm-hmm. Cause you're paying with your credit card on your way out uh, or you're hovering your palm as we like hovering to do. Hovering your palm. Yep. But the biggest thing is apparel. Like, mm-hmm. and I have so many questions, like how are they making this work? Number one, sure. like how do they know the difference between a medium and a small jersey. How do they know the difference between a seven and one quarter hat size and a seven and three eighths quarter hat size? Like, yes, that seems really crazy. Or are they, you know, cutting back the assortment? Are they putting some other type of tag on the assortment to help identify a small, medium, and large? Which I think you could do. Actually, there's probably ways to do that. Like you fix a sticker or something that's easily read by the cameras, but that could cause problems if those fall off and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I mean, my big takeaway here, Ed, for me. We gotta get we gotta get to a Seahawks game. I freaking yeah. hate the Seahawks. I loathe them. I detest them. I bleed Cardinal oh, Red really? every single day. Oh yeah, I hate them. Okay. Hate them. Hate them. Hate them. Okay. We gotta catch a game. It's probably hard yes. to get a ticket, but but yeah, Amazon. If you're listening, give it. Let's get out there. Let's check. Don't this even out. care about the game. See. Don't even no. care about the game. Just want to go to the store. Just yeah. Want to where shop the stores at the open? I wonder if the stores open all the time. I want to shop at the local fan shop. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, this is apparel, Ann. Yes, We're doing I this in apparel. I know I have, I have the same questions that you had here. Like I was wondering, have they figured out like how to triangulate like RFID tags in the clothes with computer vision right, right. and like they, good call? yes. Like, are they figuring out that like third 
portion of the quadrant yep. to understand exactly what I have to imagine it's something like that. But then, I mean, I think you posted this yesterday right. and I think Ted McCaffrey commented on your LinkedIn post where he was just saying like, this is just another feather in the cap of Amazon. And I totally agree of like being the technology platform that powers the modern store again, like moving away from Amazon's own stores as much as the revenue driver, but really being able to now in general merchandise. Cause it's like now that they have got apparel and you can add convenience items to the store. And now they've got a technology platform that could power, not that Walmart or Target would be interested in doing this. But I mean, if you start to think about like a Meyer grocery store or, so, or something, some other kind of stores that have more general merchandise types things, now they've opened up the capability to do that kind of store, to do an apparel store, to do a, a grocery store, like convenience store. They're hitting all the marks here. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. Like, the roadmap to do a full scale store with computer vision is there. The tech yeah. just has to get there, right? Yes. It has to be able to cover that ground, which probably is still far way out because you know the fan shop's a pretty small operation, most likely yep. relative to that. But your point is right. Like the roadmap, you're hitting every category now, almost. Yep. With the exception yep. of maybe a maybe apparel, maybe like some things in like home furnishings. I don't know. Like I have no idea how well that's gonna play out. But um, right. as you get into blankets and sheets and stuff like that. But um but yeah, and and the other part is like to your point, like all the specialty retailers operate stores that are you know somewhere in the country that are probably roughly the same size as these fan shops. Yep. And so like you know if I'm if I mean American Eagle to your point talked about doing this with RFID earlier this year. We haven't heard mm -hmm. anything about that. Mm -hmm. You know if I'm Gap, I'm like hmm, I need a lifeline. Do I call Amazon and maybe see what's going on here? I mean, I'm just maybe. saying. I'm just you're saying. already selling the stuff on Amazon. Maybe Gap. This is. <sighs> Just we Ooh. need to tell get Dick Ooh. Dixon, get Dick Dixon on maybe, this one, Gap. Maybe Dick Dixon sells to Amazon. Mm -hmm. That would be really Ooh. interesting. Yeah, sure. yeah, getting yeah, a, yeah. Getting our little Nostradamus pontification thing going on here late in this podcast. Dan. Oh, I like this. All right. All right. All right. Who Let's knows? wrap it up, Chris. Let's go to the lightning round here. Question one is for you. Back in 1947, Chris, one out of every 18 girls born in the United States was named Linda. But Linda's dropped really? from the number one most common female name to number 807 last year. Today, Ooh. there are fewer Lindas born than white rhinos. This is what? thanks thanks to the Best One Yet podcast for this uh, attention. This is what? one of it's one of my favorite details. Chris, who is your all time favorite Linda? And you can't say my mom because she's my favorite Linda. Oh, right. Yes. No. Yes. Shout out to her, to, to Linda S. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, no. And I mean, it's got to be Linda Ronstadt. I mean, oh, Linda, yeah. Ron Linda, Linda Ronstadt was the bomb. Okay. You know, okay. She's in she was she great. She influenced the Eagles, which I know is one of your all time favorite <laughs> bands or maybe not. But uh, but yeah, it's got to go with Linda Ronstadt. All, All right, right. Good answer. Netflix this week launched a new game controller app that lets you play games on your TV right from your phone. <laughs> And mobile game, what mobile game currently on your phone would you most want to play via this new app dubbed the Netflix Game Controller? I don't do you even have. A I don't mobile have game a, on your phone. I do not have a single mobile not game. Not a on single my phone. one. That's no, so, I don't. That's so interesting. So, like the only thing I could think of was like maybe trivia or something. Like it'd be fun okay. to do like a trivia or like some kind of one v one game or something. It's hard. I'm. I don't. I'm not. I don't nerd out like you. Star Wars, like yeah. lightsaber wars or whatever you always play, is not on my phone. Unfortunately, it seems like a dongle to me too. Like, couldn't I just screen share like my phone to my screen? Why do I have to I, do this through Netflix? But anyway, that's I don't know. I don't know, day. Chris. All right. Uh, question number three. According to the Wall Street Journal, fewer fast food customers are choosing to dine in, resulting in some heat from McDonald's and Burger King franchisees who are getting pressure from the motherships to invest in remodeling the dining areas of their stores. Chris, are you a dine-in fast foodie or do you take your show on the road? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm, you know, I'm probably like, if I think about it, I'm probably 50-50. I think it depends on the establishment and the type of food. Like, for example, like Chick-fil-A, I'm dining in because the service is so great in store. Like wet uh, burritos you're going to dine in? Yeah, well, like, a uh, yeah, no, burritos I'm probably taking out, you know? Burritos, oh, burritos, burritos as long travel. as they're not too wet. Yeah. Burritos travel better. I'll give you the best example. Like In N Out. Yeah. Even though it's like made for a drive through, In N Out is so much better when you eat it at the restaurant. That, that's the only one I could think of that I have actually dined in was In N Out. Right. 
Yeah. yeah, but McDonald's, fuck, excuse my language, but, you know, every time, every time I'm driving through that place, like, for the most part, you know. All right, land, and last one, the land, and last one, Crocker Park Shopping Center in Cleveland recently rolled out the Nightscope's K5 Autonomous Security Robot, or as some are calling it, SAM, for Secret Agent Man. Wow, that's oh creative. Gosh. There has to be a better name than SAM, right, for a autonomous security robot? You know, I love that you asked me this question because it was clearly just a tee up for your ridiculous dad joke that you posted on LinkedIn, where you called this robot Roblart for Roblart. Yeah, but yeah. I thought you could come up with a better one than that. Come on, you're creative. No, no? I no? just Ro- Roblart I, is good. I just assumed I I was supposed to tee you up for this, and that was where you were going with this question. So no, Roblart is the best possible alternative for Sam for the the robot mall cop. All right. Very nice. Oh, good. Thanks for the kudos. That was not what my intention was. My intention was to actually figure out a better name than Roblox. Sure. Sure. Okay. (laughs) All right. Nice. All right. Well, happy birthday today to Riddick Bo, Kylie Jenner, and to the woman who once took Strung Out to New Heights as the heroin addicted girlfriend to Eric Stoltz's Lance in Pulp Fiction, the one and only Rosanna Arquette. And remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail media company in the business, Make It Omni Talk, the only retail media outlet run by two former executives from a current top 10 U.S. retailer. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our twice weekly newsletter tells you all the things you need to know each and every day and also features exclusive content that we do just for you. And we try really hard to make it all fit within the preview pane of your inbox. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks, as always, for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or be sure to watch us on YouTube as well. Remember, we're off next week, but we will be back with our friends from the a Consumer and Retail Group again on August 24th. So until then, and on behalf of all of us at OmniTalk Retail, be careful out there. The OmniTalk Fast Five is brought to you in association with the a Consumer and Retail Group. The AM Consumer and Retail Group is a management consulting firm that tackles the most complex challenges and advances its clients, people, and communities toward their maximum potential. CRG brings the experience, tools, and operator like pragmatism to help retailers and consumer products companies be on the right side of disruption. And Firework. Firework is the largest video commerce solution built for the world's leading brands. They empower brands with shoppable and live stream video on their own websites where people like to shop. Put your commerce in motion with Firework. Find out more at firework.com. And SPS Commerce. SPS Commerce is redefining how businesses across the supply chain can operate in an omnichannel world. Their experts, tech, and data work together to fuel your growth and deliver for your customers. To find out more, head to spscommerce.com. And finally, Sezzle. Sezzle is an innovative buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to split purchases into four interest-free payments over six weeks. To learn more, visit sezzle.com.